Book Art Center invites a respected figure in our expansive field to the Wells College campus to share insights, experience, and expertise with the campus community. The lecture series is named for Susan Garrison Swartzberg, who established the lecture series in memory of her father, and whose efforts were integral in the formation of the Book Art Center. We're lucky and grateful for the support and advice that we receive from many individuals, some of which are here tonight in our audience. And one of which who I'm thrilled to introduce, Peter Verheinen, who's been a friend of the Book Art Center at Wells College for many years, teaching courses, even um, attending I lectures. That. I, I, oh, I found that. <laughs> <laughs> attending lectures like these and other programs. Um, to call Peter a friend of the Book Art Center is really though to say he's a friend of book arts um, as a field overall. Among his accomplishments as a conservator, a librarian, and a bookbinder, um, I really appreciate Peter's dedication to the community um, through the creation and maintenance of an active online network of book artists uh, for the last 25 years, which is really admirable. Um, I, I'm particularly um, interested in that embrace of technology and the excitement of the ability to expedite communication that the internet allows. And, how that reflects some of the initial initial fascination that I think we all have when we handle and hold books um, in the book form as a means to connect. So I'm excited for you all to learn more about Peter and his career. Um, after the talk, we'll do a QA. If you have if you have cues. <laughs> um, and then um, you've all taken an opportunity, I think, to, to look at some of these bindings in person, but we could do that after the talk as well. Yeah, come on up, and if you want, there's a broadside that a friend made for me, and some postcards if you want to grab things as well. Keep them, please. Keep your thoughts. Well, keep them. All right, thank you for sharing your thank work you with us. I'm going to unmute. Thank you. Excuse me, Peter, could you speak up a little or near the body? Are you with the microphone? I am. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right, I want to figure out a way to make this work. You can also adjust this. You can put it on. Put it on the engine here. Yeah. But you'll have to speak up for us because we can't still can't hear you. Yeah. 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 Okay. I will project. Okay. Good. All right. So, Leo, thank you for the introduction. Thank you, everybody, for having me here. Um, this it's a real honor to be a part of this series. I've really enjoyed coming here in the past years. And so to be on this side is a treat. Um, so we're going to be talking about, as Leah said, my path in book arts and also talk a lot about, in the later half especially, about the community, the online aspects. And one of the reactions that I've gotten at times from differing people is it's so anti-book, it's so unreal versus here's the tangible page. That distinction really doesn't have to be there. It's artificial. The two reinforce each other. They feed off each other. And they support each other. But how did I get into this? So I, I started out in college as a work study student at Johns Hopkins. Um, the program was being run at the time by John Dean, who some of you may also remember. Um, he was on the board here. At of the Book Art Center, I believe, and was at Cornell for many years. And working at Cornell, I mean at Hopkins as a work study student, they had a full-blown apprentice training program. And
And John was just an incredible teacher and mentor. Didn't have to be. It was a work-study job. I was repairing books and making really simple enclosures. But when there were workshops, if he saw that you were interested, you were invited to take a part in those. You could you know, ask people questions. I definitely wore the once a twit, always a twit badge that one of the other apprentices had on more than one occasion for asking too many questions beyond my station as a work study student. But it was a really great community and there was a paper conservator there. And so while I was in college, my plans initially were not to enter this field. I was supposed to become a lawyer. Things changed. But it was a wonderful introduction, it was welcoming, and I really developed an affinity for this field. Those experiences also, it was the sharing, and that's something that comes back at different times. So I was a, when I came in, I had advanced placement credits, the usual things some people come in with, and I had a semester, I could have graduated early, but because of those experiences, what I decided to do was go to Germany to do an internship in the binary conservation lab of a major museum where we knew some people, familial collect connections can be very helpful. Um, and so we arranged, this is at the Germanisches National Museum in Nuremberg, and it was an introduction. And for me, it was a place I'd been to before, that's when your ghosts come back to haunt you. And, you know, there's a guard there who's been there for a hundred years, and he says, I remember you when you were about yay high, running through the gallery, screaming at the top of your lungs. <laughs> okay, I had some things to go down. But it was, it was a really great introduction to working in a different environment. Um, Germany still had a very active, rigid apprenticeship system. It was a way to learn the literature, um, different kinds of techniques. And so most of the time, I was helping with different kinds of treatments. But there was also, at a fairly basic level, you know, clean spines, smelly eye glue, things like that. Um, so some books, watch a lot. But I also had the opportunity to learn some of these techniques on my own, making blank books, making boxes. And it was really rewarding. I was actually getting to do a lot more and I was being sucked in. Um, as this was happening, you know, it was, was suggested to me, well, why don't you go visit some binders in the area, um, talk to other apprentices, ask them what it's like. And I did some of that in Nuremberg in that area. And some of the questions were like, who are you? What do you want? Why are you here? And the culture was, it was very medieval. And, you know, it's like, what do you try, what do you want from us? So, how do you, you know, you decide, this is something I might want to pursue. How do you learn about where to go? I mean, I have family in several parts of Western Germany. How do you find out where other places are? You go to the main post office. And the main post office and the telephone company were one and the same. And they have the phone books for every city across the country. And you start looking in the yellow pages, and you see which ads look the most interesting, and you just start writing down names and numbers. So I did that, a lot of copying, and it was interesting. You learn things. Came back had a semester to go before graduation, and wanted to keep developing this, you know, the skills that I had developed already, keep those going, built myself a press, sewing frame, had basic tools, lived like Harry Potter under the stairs, <coughs> and, you know, that infrastructure, if you're taking classes, if you're interested in book finding, book arts, pretty much anything, there isn't a lot that's required. It's a fairly basic set of hand tools, some glue, you can make paste. If you make paste out of wheat starch and it's not really, and it's too thick, it makes a rubber ball. It might stick to the wall, it might not. Um, but you know, you want, it, you want to keep it going. And so if you're taking classes, keep those skills going, keep those chops developed. Um, I started saying, okay, 
I think I'm going to do this. Definitely not going to go to law school after I got my LSAT scores. And, well, you always need a plan B. So, in Germany, the practice is your application letters are handwritten. They want to see your handwriting. They want to have a picture attached. They want to know if you're single, Catholic, or Protestant. All those things that we would now shudder at in HR. Um, I wrote my CV, my, my very short two-page resume, out by hand as well. I probably could have photocopied that, but I really wasn't thinking that far. Um, and mailed all those out. Got several invitations to appear next weekend. Had to explain that if you look at, very nicely, if you look at the envelope, you will realize this was mailed from the United States. I need at least four to six weeks to get a good flight. Scheduled that after classes were over, visited three binaries, had offers from two. Um, one that I visited that I had an offer from was probably the most honest first impression. You walk into a shop, there's big piles of books all over the place, machinery, you know, it's there, some of it's maintained, some of it isn't. The one that I really liked was in an artist colony, and I was lucky to get accepted there, and I thought it would be a real kind of neat atmosphere, and it was. And so, we, after I graduated, the apprenticeship started, I believe, like the first of July. And so, pack up everything, including the press and sewing frame I bought, put them in the mail. You could mail things in a big mail bag those days. So, you know, starting my apprenticeship, I'm sewing my book. And an apprenticeship, in kind of heaven, basically means your apprenticeship years, you're not your own master. And in the medieval period, that was most certainly the case, because you might start apprenticing when you're 10, 12 years old. It was definitely in loco parentis, as my master said to me, if you're sick, your only excuse is if you're carrying your head under it in your arms, and you're mine. So those were the rules. It was a very rigid system, but you know there were pluses and there were minuses. The advantages, some of the things were, it was all regulated by the state. So there was a lesson plan that all apprentices had to work towards. It was a three-year apprenticeship. It specified more or less what you were to learn at what phase of each year. You had to keep a journal. The master had to sign off. All sorts of things like that. You had to go to trade school. I was 21. I was technically not required to go to trade school. That caused some interesting situations when I said, I think I better go to trade school when I pass this exam. Trade school, you know, it's basically in the old, well, even but in the old days, like in the 80s and before, when I was there, people might drop out of school, and drop out is a really bad term to use because learning a trade is incredibly acceptable. It's, you know, there's a certain stature to it. It's not like, oh, you're just going to go, you know, pick up your wrench at Joe's Garage and pump gas or something like that. Actually, if you wanted to pump gas, you'd have to do a traditional apprenticeship, and you'd learn how gasoline is made. In the bookbinding context, we had to learn, you know, in trade school, these were things that were great for me. I had to take a social studies class. I was a German lit major. I was, I'd started out as history. I still took a lot more history classes, especially 20th century, 1920th, than lit classes. And I'm thinking, like, I'm going to social studies? Well, nobody had ever really taught me how the government is set up, how you, you know, voting, what the responsibilities, what the compact is between the government and the people. It was actually pretty interesting. Math. I had to take a math class. And it's a lot of one plus one and stuff like that. But it's, all right, you have an edition of 10,000 books that you have to buy. These are the dimensions. This is the number of pages. This is the thickness of the paper. You're going to machine sew it. What thickness of thread do you need to get your book block to be this size? How many yards of material do you need? And how long is it supposed to take? So, you know, and the next step to that would be, you know, cost out the whole job. And those were things that even as an apprentice you were starting to learn. Then there were the machines. 
I was lucky. I was in a small hand binder. We did everything by hand. I had people in my class who worked. There was one person who worked at a magazine publisher, basically running a state tour all day. The only way he was going to learn the things that he needed to pass that exam was in trade school. So we learned some of the finer things. We also had to take a machine course. So here's a big roll of paper. It weighs 10 tons. There's a fold, you know, it prints it, it folds it, and then it spits out little gathered signatures at the other end. And then you have to know how to work that machine. The teacher that we had, you know, he'd wave his fingers and say, and they, you know, was missing a few tips, and the others had gotten smashed. And you know, you listened at that point, otherwise we ignored them. But you learned a lot of good things. So this was, uh, this is a view into the shop where I served my apprenticeship, and the work that we did was library binding at, you know, but at scale. So we did about 100 to 200 volumes for industrial libraries. They all had their reference libraries, hospitals, lawyers, things like that, a week. As the apprentice, you pull the staples. If you put staples into a guillotine, you're going to take a chip out of the blade, and then there's going to be hell of a day. I did it twice. <laughs> um, you know, every once in a while, one gets past you. But what it was was really it was merciless repetition. You're working, you're putting together these covers in batches of a hundred. You know, and the first one wasn't so great, but after that. You really develop a flow, you develop this muscle memory, if you will, where you can think about what you're going to do, and you're working, you can talk, and your hands are flying, and you're doing the work, and it works, it's good. Um, and one of the, it was good because I, you know, working with John Dean doing book repair, he insisted on doing batches. And so, you know, John said, well, you have to do at least six of these an hour. And I was doing about four, and he decided to time me, and I got five done. I said, all right, I can do five. Um, you know, when you're working with the master and he dictates the pace, you have to keep up because he might be gluing the stuff out. You have to cover it. You're keeping pace with him. You know, as part of the apprenticeship, one of the things we got, the shop got, was the monthly bookbinding journal newsletter, which was for the trade. And they organized an annual apprentice bookbinding competition that was divided by year. So, wow, this looks like fun. And so it was a set book. You would get the, the signatures. You, they were folded already, but you had to sew them, you had to trim them. And you can see on the um, right there, there's you know little grades cards. You got pretty brutal comments in there. So for this book, um, they noted a dent in the end paper in the front. They noticed that I had over trimmed the book. They thought my head cap was too clunky and my boards were way too chunky. Right on all counts. Me? I didn't like that at all at the time. But you learn and you know, take when the dent was because I had left the cords bunched up and when I put it in the press to back it would be, you know, you don't do that again either. But that's how you learn. But this is an annual thing and it's still going on. It's something that started in the late 1920s and they find the book binding, book binders apprentice journal and really incredible source of information. That's how people learn that augmented what they learned in trade school and they needed to know for their exams. Um, you know, if you look at the bindings that I brought, you're, as Leah said, you're welcome to come up and look at them afterwards, handle them, but one of my favorite materials is parchment, and I really love parchment. It's different from leather. It's, 
you know, you can't, it's not, traditionally not tooled to the same extent, but I'm not a finisher either, but it just has really, really wonderful properties. Um, but, you know, I was over there, I was working, and how do you learn about things like the apprentice competition? You know, it comes in a print journal. Um, how do you learn about jobs, other things? You were really, you were waiting for that newsletter to arrive in the mail. When I came back to the States, you know, it's the same kind of thing. There were apprentices really didn't talk to each other much outside of shop. Um, you certainly didn't go hang out at other shops because their masters would be looking at you as like, what trade secret are you trying to steal? And all those trade secrets are incredibly well documented because in the German tradition, at least, the bookbinding manuals were written for apprentices and those who wanted to become masters. You know, they're about this thick, real door stops, and they covered everything. Material science, all these different techniques, handbook binding, machines, everything. And so the only secrets that you could really steal, and they're actually the best ones to steal, are if you're watching someone either, you know, working and you watch their hands, how are they turning that material in? How are they holding their brush? What do they have around? Those are the things worth stealing. You should be doing that right now anyway. So finished up my apprenticeship in two years rather than three. Um, you know, most of that was because I had previous experience. I say I got off in two years for bad behavior, which had to do with trade school because I enrolled myself. I had to, I was no way I was going to pass, and that cost some waves. So, eh, that's life. But it was, you know, it's, it's after the apprenticeship, it was years after that you really realize what it is that you learned. And, you know, I have a really good relationship with my master's wife who was doing her journeyman years, working there when I was there. And, you know, it, it's, it's good to have those connections and you want to build those networks and, you know, learn from the good as well as the bad. So following my apprenticeship, I went off from that point heading towards very post-industrial um, industrial heartland, North Jersey, Gary, Indiana, Germany, <coughs> and the River Valley to the beautiful Ticino um, um, down in Switzerland in Ascona, which had a school for book restoration. And one of the prerequisites for that was that you had to have completed an apprenticeship. And the reason for that is actually fairly simple. They don't want to teach you how to bind the book. They want to teach you the finer points. So they expect you to learn how to know how to pair leather. Maybe you don't know how to do a gothic binding, but that's what they'll teach you. <coughs> so in that, in that coursework, that's where I got chemistry for the first time, learned paper conservation, how to do pulp fills, um, do vellum binding, limb structures, made clasps. That, that's a book that was my father's and had an impression of the class, so I had to have books to work on, they didn't give them to you. So he sent me a bunch, and so for that book, if there were some repairs, I had to fix a board that had been cracked, and um, make the clasps new. But the conservation is, that's where I wanted to head, and that's also, if you think about book buying as a career, as a direction, you'll find that most of the jobs are actually in libraries, doing repair, doing conservation, if you're in private practice, you're going to be doing an awful lot of repair and rebinding as well. All the fine binding, pretty books, that's dessert when you can get it and fit it in afterwards. So, return back to the U.S. after Escona and spent my journeyman years, I call them, working in, tr in trade bindery, conservation studios, and private practice before ending up in libraries, and my first real job was at a place called Monastery Hill Bindery in Chicago. It was founded by German immigrants in the um, mid-1800s. It had a conservation studio, and then and all the rest was making menu covers. It was really, it was a trade binder. 
And that was a good, good experience working in that kind of environment. Um, ended up switching and working with William Minter also in Chicago, which was really, I think for me professionally, one of the best experiences of my career because Bill Minter is one of the most recognized conservators. And he was constantly pushing my buttons, I mean, asking questions. Have you thought about why you're doing this? What if you did it this way? What do you think would happen? And there was a dialogue, there was a certain tension back and forth with that. And he was trained in the English tradition, I was trained in the German tradition. We're lucky there were no French people there. Um, because that would have been really interesting. They're all very different ways of approaching things, but it's really how you learn, and we did some fantastic work when we were there for collectors and libraries throughout the Midwest. Um, ended up at Yale, which was my first institutional job, and this was in 1991, and you know, we're starting to get online. I had an email account through CompuServe with a really slow dial-up modem. Um, and there was conservation list circles up there. And you know, there's ways starting for conservators to start exchanging information. The whole communications paradigm was changing. And so was the conservation field. I mean, at Yale, I was starting to get introduced to really big collections-based product projects. That certainly continued in a really big scale when I came to Cornell in 93, and was again working with John Dean. We were doing really big collections-based pro projects where it was high-level conservation work. But even then, and then when I came to Syracuse, the really, the full treatments, the take the book apart, wash it, deacidify, started to be called for less and less. It was started to be more rehousing, minimal repair, repair and support of digitization. It, things were changing. And they're still changing. So I moved to Ithaca. It's 1994. And there's really nothing going on here. No offense. I mean, the Book Art Center was, had just started. There were really very few people at Cornell who were interested in book arts in terms of doing things. I really missed my communities in New Haven and Chicago. And conducting book binding discussions on a rare books librarians list or a conservation list and you know, let alone freaky foldy book arts, wasn't going to cut it very long. And Peter Graham, who ran Ex Libris List Serve, who would come to Syracuse as director several years later, and Walter Henry, who ran the, the conservation list, said, you know, Cornell has the list serve. You can set up your own. It's like, okay, how hard is that? It really wasn't. And People you know, send out a few notes, and people started subscribing. People all over the world, there were 500 subscribers that was, we started in June by December of that year, and it was really starting to pick up. There was dialogue there, but at the same time, there was starting to get certain pushback from groups like the Guild of Book Workers and others. What are you doing online? We're print culture. It's paper. You want your newsletter to come in your mail. Saying, yeah, but I want to see those job ads as soon as they come out, and I want to know when exhibits are coming up, and we can do this faster. Yeah, it's pushing buttons again. So those are you know, the listserv. I started a website in '94, and then in 2004, I also started a key journal, which got me into trouble again. Um, but it was all worth it. So, most of the work, most of the money, most of the jobs are in libraries doing conservation work. But I also really enjoy just finding and expressing myself a little bit more creatively. And, you know, the only way you can really do that is if you're working at home. And so, 
one of the things that I did was make, you know, just acquiring everything or more things that I needed. And sometimes it was just I really needed it. So that would really be nice to have. And you know, doing that incrementally. So it, you know, if you have as your income increases, you can buy more things. Um, and acquire more books and do things. You can experiment, you can keep your skills sharp. When you're doing book repair and conservation, you're not really going to be able to get that creative. You have to be creative in different ways. And um, so, two views. One is my studio in Chicago after I've made paste papers, and you can see those dangling from the ceiling of my dining room slash studio. The other is my studio as it exists now. And you know, I'm still using the workbenches that I built with my father in 1987. They shipped flat. I could fit my whole bindery in the back of my Hyundai Excel subcompact when I moved <coughs> to Chicago. It was fantastic. Um, having these things, being able to do private work for people was really nice. It was a nice source of income and basically supported my habit. Um, it was nice to be independent also of employers for different things, so that you always knew you could fall back on something in one way or another. So one of the things as a conservator, you know, and I'm experimenting, I'm doing bindings. This was um, one of my first bindings to travel internationally. Went to an exhibit that the Guild of Bookworkers organized that went to Paris in 1990, and then the Bollier Club in New York City. And this is a transparent vellum binding of Dante's Inferno, and the, what's underneath it is a woodcut that was done by someone who was working with me at Bill Nature's shop, who was a printmaker. And this is you know, a very colorful woodcut. And it really fit, it was part of a series that she did called Foundry Town, and it really fit that Inferno feel and Tom Phillips's introductions, and translation and illustrations of the text. Um, this was a set book show where Ladislav Hanka is an etcher engraver, and he had four books, and each of us in the show, that it's called 50 by 25, would get two, two of the same book that we had to bind. He got to keep one copy, we got to keep the other. And so mine was basically, it was about the life cycle of the trout. And so you had images like on the front cover where you see the skeletal dead fish floating. And in the engravings, in the etchings in the book, it's you see it through these roots and things in the water, it's kind of hung up there, and the veiny calf bellum really brought that to life. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's playing with the translucency of the material, and um, that was a lot of fun. This is about as freaky foldy as I ever got. This was an alphabet book that I did with an MFA student I met at Syracuse, Torsten Dennerlein, and I said, Torsten, we've got, he, he described himself as the poor man's Baskin. He's no longer the poor man's Baskin. But um, I said, do you want to do an alphabet book? And he said, sure. I'll do the binding, you do the illustration. He said, so how do we want to do this? We picked 26 words out of the dictionary, kind of at random. And he did illustrations for those. They're all um, offset lithography. I did the bindings. It was an accordion edition of ten books. And this was one of the deluxe, one of the you know out of the series that I had. And so the covers are leather. It's goat, and the um, thing in the middle, the gray, is frog skin. The case that you see to the left is leather covered with parchment, which has the words kind of showing through it. It's hinged at the bottom left corner, so that's how you take the book out. Um, I'm not a big fan of accordions, but I learned fairly doing this why artists love accordions. Because you can stretch out the whole book and you can look at each and every one. If you have a codex, you're really just looking at the page spread. Um, 
another book. This um, was actual. This was something I sent in to a Society of Bookbinders competition in 2004, and it's got eel skin trim. It's up in front here. You can see it, and a paste paper cover. And Society of Bookbinders in England is a very traditional organization. And I got, there was a prize for forwarding, so that's all that is the stuff that's not finishing, just how did you make the book, is it neat, all that. I got the prize for that and I was really surprised because it was a very German structure, paste paper, it's, it's, there was really no leather. Why not? It was a lot of fun. And it's a structure I really love doing. And I love making paste papers as well. Um, we're starting to get into the fish here. And this was a binding that I did for a Canadian show. And it's called The Book of Origins, and it's based, it deals with creation myths, mostly First Nations in Canada. And animals, water, things like that are a really big part of those. So this is, the boards are leather. The spine is parchment, and that's cod that's kind of across the spine. Um, that's leather, not parchment. Um, when this show ended, Karen Hammer, who succeeded me as exhibitions chair for the Guild of Book Workers, said, let's take it on tour. So we got all the American binders together and found libraries that were willing to host it, put an online catalog together, and shared it that way, and people are still looking at it. This is probably the binding that I worked on the longest. Um, I started in 1995, and then <coughs> it languished, and then I did a little bit more, and then it languished. And I finally submitted it for the Guild of Bookworkers exhibit, Marking Time. I was really marking time with this book. and. The author, John Vassos, it, and his wife wrote the story. It's basically the opposite of what's happening to us now. We built skyscrapers. We built, built really big airships. The book is from 1930. Um, darkened the sun. We entered an ice age. We had to live underground, under the ice. And finally, we got off this rock and went into space with this big cannonball type thing. So that's what's on the cover. The illustrations that Vasos does are washed, very hard edged, all gray, shades of gray. I kind of flipped it so that the cover is white for the ice and snow, and the other thing, the ship is black and becoming gray. Another book that's here is The Mentoring Stamp, and this was a set book show, and this is paste paper, three different sheets, and it's scalloped, so it's kind of like you're tearing apart stamps, postage stamps, like you mail things, you know, you buy stamps. You can't lick them anymore. It's really too bad. You can hardly look, get envelopes that you look anymore. Yeah, this is also up front. This is probably one of the bindings that I'm most proud of and I really like. Um, the boards are deerskin vellum. It's, the spine is goat vellum. I sewed it at an angle. I had to figure that out, make sure that it works with the cover as well. And the book is called The Thread That Binds, and it's basically their narratives, their interviews with bookbinders working in private practice. The book was writ, compiled, written by a woman, Pamela Lutz, in Texas. This was for the Guild's Lone Star chapter. And it really, you know, it works. It was a way to play with the structure of the book, the design, which is really isn't something that I've done. Most of the time, I let the materials speak for themselves or just kind of flagge it, but I really have a lot of fun with this one. This is the Crucible um, that was done for Chicago. We used to have one, one book, one city, except they had multiple books.
Fields. And so I chose the Crucible. And I found a first edition of it very cheaply. The book had gotten wet at one point. There were water stains. I'm a conserver. I can rip a book apart, throw it in the bathtub. It's not a big deal. Cleaned up beautifully. And you know, the Crucible is about a witch trial, but it's not really about a witch trial, it's about McCarthy, it's about, you know, ostracizing people, it's about today. And so, what, it, what I did was, I found the list of all the names that were part of the McCarthy investigation, whatever you want to call it, and my original design was to get a photopolymer plate made, that would cover the whole cover with a selection of these names. And so I picked names, some of the names I knew, so we have Zero Mostel on there, Arthur Miller was on that list, um, Robeson, a lot of, excuse me? Yeah, and so in, in that design it was just supposed to be with the red lettering didn't change, but it was supposed to be just names blind and lost into the leather. That polymer plate idea didn't work. I couldn't get enough pressure. Um, when I did get enough pressure, finally, and I left it in too long, the water that I dampened the leather reacted with the polymer, softening the polymer, causing the polymer to stick to the leather so that when I removed it, I also removed leather. So I did this twice, and then I finally got out my stamping press, hand set all the type, greatly reduced the number of names, but I wasn't going to do the whole thing name by name by name. And then, so those black bars represent all the names that I left out. So that was my way of dealing with it. And then you stamped a letter? Yeah, so the, the, the names that you see up there are just stamped in blood. So this was is another one of those freaky things that I did. And you know, with this online community, you get to know a lot of people with the e-journal, the bone folder that I published. The woman who organized this show had written an article on research that she was doing about link structures in Estonia. And so she said, I'm doing this thing about the Vatican. You want to be in the show? Can we publicize it? Who would be other binders? to have working in it and participating. And so what she did is she sent us, about 15, 20 of us, a model that she had made at the Vatican of one of their structures, and then we were to interpret it. So this is mine, and the, my model had two different sewing structures in one wrapper. I took those two different sewing structures, put them in separate wrappers that are actually connected. So if those of you know, or Joe, I know it's the French would say. Um, this was something for Designer Bookbinders exhibit in the UK that also traveled through the US. Um, the book that I chose is Mayflies. It's about mayflies, which fish eat. In, in the context of this, it had to do with also you know, with trout fishing. The spine of this is salmon leather. The mayflies are illustrations that I took out of the book, scanned, and then printed, and Again, it's playing with the translucency of the vellum. And then on the front cover, at the far right, there's actually a little fly that's fishing fly that's attached to it. Um, then there's Karsik, something completely different. John Waters. Everybody here knows, most people know who John Waters is. Tasteless, disgusting, polyester, pink flamingos, hairspray. He hitchhiked across the country, it's three books in one, so it was material as metaphor and also the means of production as a metaphor for the book. Um, you know, made my own hitchhiking sign through the middle of the street from a library in Syracuse, had trucks and things run over during my lunch break, people thought I was crazy. Um, got maps at the AAA for Baltimore where we started, and San Francisco where we finished up, those are the end sheets, and then flyover states in the middle, and bring up a coffee cup on the front cover for additional decor. <laughs> that has not been exhibited anywhere. I just did it for fun. 
So, you know, doing all these bindings, one of the things that I also did was, there was, you know, at the very beginning of Nuremberg, there was this book that I been introduced to, very charmingly pedantic or pedantically charming, dialogue between a bookbinder and a bibliophile. It's an introduction to the craft of bookbinding in Germany in the 1920s and a little bit earlier in terms of the techniques. And so I translated that and shared my, the article also appeared online and it was found by someone who said, I think I'm related. This is what I know. What else do you know? And I couldn't really say much because the only thing that I knew about him as author in terms of his biography was that he was a son of court bookbinders and he disappeared in 1933. Um, kind of an odd date to pick, but it's a date that made sense. Um, so I started digging in deeper. I found more and more articles about him. I was able to fit, fit together a biography for him. And it really it grew into this really big project. And another edition of the translation, which had a greatly expanded biography. But most of my research, I was researching you know, periodicals from the 1920s in Germany and things like that. When I started in 2008, Google Books had just started. There was very little in it. When she found this in 2013, a lot more had come online. And over the interim, you know, the, the next four years, it was an, it's, it's amazing how much research you can do using online collections. How much research you can do corresponding with people online, asking questions, whoever they are. In the context of this project, being bilingual definitely helped because I couldn't do it otherwise. But, you know, it, it's really something that wouldn't have been possible when I started in the field 30 years ago. And, and this is the title page of it. And it's Questbangle, it's a tool that German binders use to type in presses. I trans use bone folded because it's a tool that everybody recognized. But it's a charmingly and pedantic title, subtitle for it, and I kind of kept that style. Um, in the course of redoing the research, um, Ernst Collin, who wrote the book, wrote about a lot more than book binding. He was an editor, he was a publisher. Um, he wrote about economics, he wrote about um, art, he was an art critic. Fish appeared in the context of austerity, so, you know, in the 19 World War I, there were blockades, you couldn't get things, but you, could, you still owned the Baltic, you were still getting fish. Um, let's can it, let's do stuff with it. In one of my German apprentice bookbinding journals from, this was, I believe, um, this was 1937, there was an article about this young apprentice, Phipps, who wanted to do something for the annual competition. Besides, I'm going to go next door to the fishmonger and get myself something. They sold him an eel. That's an eel skin. I mean, eel back then were huge, but he couldn't be. And he described how he did it. And he's like, really? This is really basic. I talked with a friend of mine, Jesse Meyer, who makes parchment, who said, yeah, it can be. Jesse, will you make some for me if I buy your family, you know, big family pack salmon from Wegmans? Uh, no. So it kind of lingered until my wife Hope brought me a really big salmon and said, cut bait or fish. So we did. But, you know, Phipps was one of the inspirations for that. Um, Ernst wrote an article about making, preparing fish skin. Um, and it was illustrated with photographs of him. I would like to imagine that the gentleman in the top left image at the right is him from his back. Um, there are no known pictures of him. This past summer, bookbinder Barbie came to visit. She's a project of North... Somebody laughing. Came to visit. 
And she's a North Bennett Street student project. She's now in her second year, and so she was um, traveled the country by Air USPS, and we all got to pose her in our studios. I did some binding with her, but I also made some parchment with her, and there she is making sure it's all nice and taut on the frame. Oh, no. Is it, that's not a real person. That's Barbie. It's a Barbie doll. Oh, it's a Barbie. Okay. <laughs> it's a Barbie doll. Trust me. She has her own Instagram feed. At Bookbinder Barbie. Um, these are some of the skins. The one at the top is on two of the books that are here. The others two are were used. And when you're doing it, that's just scraping off little fleshy bits, but they're very fibrous of it. And then this is the book that's in the front. Um, you know, while I was doing all the binding working as a conservator since 1994. I've been running the solicitor. We've had, in 25 years, 84,000 posts by 6,770 distinct posters, um, 3 million visitors to the website. The e-journal has been downloaded 263,000 times. Um, the blog, where I've been sharing the bookbinding research, or Fish Skin and Ernst Collins, 417,000. And an accompanying blog about the same. The background image shows all those postings by year and month. This is what I do in my day job now with institutional data from the University and the Library of Syracuse. is circulations and stuff, and pretty pictures. Um, so I decided to do this a few years ago. But you can also see from the image that's on top that over the years that activity has gone down. And some of that is because we've got social media taking over, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. There's a lot of activity there as well, but it's still, it's still a real, you know, as a community, it's still growing very strongly. Um, if somebody has a really, you know, disruptive in the good sense means to replace me, please do so. I don't know if I'll go for another 25 years. I kind of doubt it. But you know, this is a reflection of the book arts community on a global scale and the level of activity. And it really is incredibly vibrant. And there's so much that we share and you know learn from each other in that forum. And that's really what it, is, what it is. It's another tool in our toolbox. It's not replacing the handprinted book. It's allowing us to make fun. And, uh, and those are parting thoughts, for, especially for students. I'm not going to read them. Those of you who still use QR codes, those will take you there. You can snap it from 100 yards of work. I tried. And um, the slides I can make available if someone's interested, but I'd really like to thank you for coming. And if you have questions, want to look at books, please do. Thank you.